preparing. I got the little warning thing that this is being live streamed. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I think we are live, and we are. Cool. Great. Great. Well, hi, I am Billy Griffith with Emerging Revolutionary War, coming to you tonight with another installment of our Sunday Night Rev War Revelry. Uh, tonight, we are sitting down with Nate McDonald and Travis Shaw to discuss the American invasion of Canada and the 1775 Battle of Quebec. Uh, so before we start, I'd like to thank Nate and Travis for being on here tonight, and I'm going to give them an opportunity, uh, even though they have been on some of our Zooms prior to this. Uh, for those of you who don't know who they are, I'll give them an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves. So, uh, Travis, you want to start? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's nice to be back here on the uh, Rev War Revelry. Uh, I'm Travis Shaw. I'm the Director of Education for the Virginia Piedmont Heritage Area. Um, I have a, a pretty big background in 18th century history, worked at Mount Vernon for a while, um, background in museum education, archaeology, material culture. Cool. All right, Nate. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Nathan McDonald. I've also been, I think I've only been on the sub-series of uh, 1812 Revelry, I don't know what we want to call it, <laughs> um, but it, it is good to be back here. Uh, I'm a historic interpreter with Prince William County Office of Historic Preservation in Virginia um, at Princeville Courthouse Historic Center. Uh, I worked with the National Park Service. I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley, kind of more in the heart of uh, Frisian Indian War territory, but also with an interest in um, especially uh, Continental Army things during the uh, revolution. Awesome. Well, before we uh, get into the actual campaign and Battle of Quebec, um, one of you kind of paint us a picture of this is the first year of the American Revolution. Uh, what has gone on so far elsewhere uh, throughout North America, kind of setting the stage for this invasion of Canada? Um, <laughs> who wants to lead this one off? Wow. No, you can start, um, Travis. You spoke up first. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the, the biggest thing going on in 1775 in terms of the military situation is the siege of Boston. You know, the main British army in North America is bottled up in Boston. Um, Washington's army has them surrounded. Um, there are some small actions taking place. You know, there's a, a campaign to drive Lord Dunmore from Southeast Virginia. Um, there's some fighting further on South in the Carolinas, but the big, big, big show is happening in Boston. You know, that's really where everyone expects the war to be won or lost at this point. Nate, you have anything to add? Yeah, and, and what, uh, as Travis said, um, those are kind of the three main sort of fields of operations. Um, there's there's some activity in Georgia, then both the Carolinas as well. But yeah, I mean, everybody's kind of, even, even from the deep south, um, you're starting to see some movement funneled up to support the, uh, the lines at Boston. And, uh, and of course, one of the things that's going to end up being significant for the uh, campaign in Canada is going to be the arrival of... Um, Virginia riflemen from the, the lower Shenandoah Valley, Northern Virginia, and uh, from Maryland, Pennsylvania as well. Um, when they're not entirely well suited, shall we say, <laughs> for um, for heavy modern siege operations. But it is, it's definitely, it's occupying Congress's attention in time, the the public attention of the time, and, uh, and for the British command as well. Uh, it's definitely a, a significant focus of the, the government back home in London. All right. So um, following in May 1775, uh, Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen uh, lead the Green Mountain Boys to capture Fort Ticonderoga uh, near the southern end of Lake Champlain. And after that, this idea of men are starting to run to Congress and, and pitch plans to invade Canada. Uh, at first, the Continental Congress is going to be really wishy-washy, go back and forth on the perspectives of actually of uh, sending an army north into Canada. Uh, but they finally do agree uh, during the summer of 1775 to organize a force, the separate army was known as to invade Canada. Now, why Canada? Why is, is it so important on, on sending an army there? 
Well, I, I think it's a lot of wishful thinking on the part of Congress and, and the people who are promoting these expeditions. Um, you know, it's important to note that Canada was, you know, New France up until the 1760s. Um, there's a belief in Congress that, you know, these French Canadians are looking for an excuse to throw the British yoke off uh, and that they will be welcomed as liberators rather than invaders if they should send an army into Canada, um, you know, as it will turn out, that is way, way, way different than what they will actually find when they enter Canada. Um, you know, they will be disappointed with the support they find. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, well, I'll, I'll let Nate speak up here. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I imagine Travis and I are thinking kind of the same thing, but I would also kind of outline background wise, um, they're kind of, Congress is sort of working off of old information. Um, they, their, of course, personal opinions and things like that have been formed over quite a number of years where, again, most of them that seen the transition of Canada from France to Great Britain to a, uh, a new state, which, uh, is, is sort of brought around by the Quebec Act of 1774. Uh, before that, they, they might've had a, a lot more legitimacy, um, with the, the French speaking population, especially in Canada, um, because the Quebec Act had sort of walked back a lot of the typical British restrictions that had been placed on the citizens of Quebec. Uh, namely, since they had they were, again, primarily French speaking, um, it allows more of the use of, of French in government and things like that. It also protected the free practice of Catholicism uh, and removed references to Protestant uh, Protestantism from oaths and things that had to be sworn for government offices, um, to testify in court, things like that. So even though that, that's only been a, a year before, um, the, the Canadian government, um, the, the governor, British government in Canada, has realized that implementing this act is, is very important in the face of um, potential unrest and disruption. But there, there, are, there are still some who are, are not satisfied with that, or they would definitely be kind of in the fringe um, though of of beliefs in Canada and it's what they they bring to Congress or what they they write to Congress is more in the way of confirming Congress's existing thoughts than it is actually really useful <laughs> yeah I, I think it's impossible to understate the effect of the Quebec Act um, you know protecting the things that these French Canadians really hold hold dear. Um, I think it's also really important to note that the population, the society that exists along the St. Lawrence or in Quebec is very, very, very different than what you're gonna see in the English colonies on the East Coast. You know, New France was a, a semi-feudal society and, you know, very deeply conservative society. Um, you know, life really revolved around the Catholic Church, um, you know, the local lords, yeah, the, the seniors, these large landowners, um, without the support of the Catholic Church, and without the support of these large landowners, you are not going to get the bulk of the Canadian population on board. Um, the Canadians that we do see that will, you know, provide this information to Congress or join the the Continental Army um, tend to be rather new imports to Canada. They tend to be a lot of American-born or British-born uh, subjects who have moved there since the conquest of Quebec. And, you know, they're more attuned to this kind of political um, milieu that's kind of going around in the colonies at the time. Um, and, you know, the, the French Canadians tend to be a little more ambivalent um, or even hostile to to the uh, American invasion. It, it's also worth uh, mentioning too, um, as Travis said, uh, well, I'll throw one thing in. Moses Hazen comes up a lot. We talk yeah. about uh, <laughs> Canadians. He's from Massachusetts. Right. <laughs> uh, he, he, he'd not been in Canada all that long. All things yeah, it's considered. like James Livingston's from New York. Like these guys are all real recent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty recent newcomers to Canada. Um, but as Travis also mentioned, you know, it, there is the differences between the New England colonies and Canada, uh, it's a lot of long held hostility. Um, mercantile hostility with the, the traders and fur trappers and um, shippers of, of Canada uh, and also uh, open hostility. I mean, most of that, we're talking about a lot of the, the men who are 
leaders of the American Revolution grew up in the generation uh, that saw active hostile fighting with the the French population of Quebec and Canada. And, you know, the the younger generation has still grown up with those stories very much being kind of the uh, ongoing narrative, shall we say, um, of, of sort of daily conversation about them. So there's there's a lot of back and forth hostility between common Canadian and the common American, New England, especially settler as well. Um, that's also kind of based in their their different religious practices, different language, and that long held hostility. None of this is to say that Canadians did not support the movement, just not in the numbers that Congress would to believe that they would. Yeah, there were definitely, and there were definitely a lot of people who were not happy with the way things were going government wise. Um, was Travis mentioned the the seniors, uh, much like the upstate New York uh, poltroons, the the very upper class sort of landholding aristocrats. There were people who were who were pretty genuinely unhappy with that system and wanted to see it changed. They just didn't necessarily want to see the Americans involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, now, did Travis had mentioned what was going on in Boston at around the same time? Um, with the main British army uh, kind of bottled up there, although they are able to get reinforcements out to elsewhere, uh, what troops are actually in Canada and are tasked with defending us in Montreal and Quebec? Not many. Not many. <laughs> Not many. Um, you know, the, the, the bulk of the troops that the British are going to be able to draw upon are Canadian militia. And again, you know, their, their loyalty is kind of suspect, or at least their enthusiasm is a little suspect. Um, there are a handful of regular British Army regiments in Canada. You know, you have the 7th Regiment um, that's in Montreal, Quebec. Um, the 8th Regiment is kind of scattered out in companies throughout the Great Lakes area. Um, there's really not a lot for the, the British government to draw upon. Um, and they're going to end up drawing upon a lot of kind of local support. And I know before we started, Nate mentioned the Royal Highland emigrants. I think, you know, they're going to play a huge role in the story of the Battle of Quebec. So now might be a good time to introduce these guys. Yeah, go ahead. And also, uh, you know, who commanded these men? that were defending Canada. Um, so the, the ultimate military control is gonna be under the, the governor general there, uh, Guy Carleton. Um, Carleton's a really, really, I think, underappreciated figure in the history of the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, he grows up as part of this like Anglo-Irish Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. Um, great military pedigree. You know, he fights in the War of Austrian Succession. He's gonna fight in the Seven Years' War. Um, becomes very, very, very close friends with General Wolfe, you know, the conqueror of Quebec. Um, he's going to play a big role in the actual uh, events in Canada in the Seven Years' War, um, the Siege of Havana and so forth. Um, so really, you, it's hard to think of a better guy for the job. He's certainly familiar with the colony. He's familiar with the people, the lay of the land. Um, so he's going to be an overall command. And if you want to talk about uh, to those uh, Highland immigrants, go ahead. Oh yeah, sure. So uh, the technically, uh, if I remember the number right, they're they're officially the 84th Regiment of Foot. Yep. Um, they are, uh, as of course the war goes on, and Britain needs more regiments to uh, fill the garrisons of its. Again, we, we tend to kind of think of the war being sort of between if you if you go as far north as Canada, uh, down to to Georgia, but really for for Britain. Um, at, at almost the height of its its colonial power, they have troops all the way from uh, India, Indone what's now Indonesia, um, the Pacific Ocean, Africa, um, the up and down the Atlantic coast in the Caribbean, all over the world. Um, and as more and more of these men are being, the regular regiments are being sucked to North America, uh, new regular regiments are created to fill them in. Uh, but the Highland immigrants are kind of uh, unique. They're, they're being recruited from those who are living in the colonies um, onto the regular establishment, as opposed to being raised as uh, provincials or, or loyalist troops. Uh, and the primary reason for that is most of these guys that they're aiming to recruit, um, I should say, I believe it's, it's uh, Alan McLean, is the, the initial lieutenant colonel uh, commanding the regiment, the field tasked with recruiting these men. He's looking for a very particular kind of man, which is to say 
Um, he's looking for mainly men who are veterans of the French and Indian War and that are uh, Scottish, uh, primarily Highlanders. There's some Lowlanders um, that had settled in North America following the French and Indian War. There was quite a number of them that had, as their enlistments had come up, uh, decided to settle in North America and make a new life rather than return home to um, either being crofters or, or stuck with uh, tenant jobs back home in Scotland. They stayed in the Americas, made a new life for themselves. Uh, and again, there, there's, there's of course a divide as there are in most American communities during the war. But uh, a number of them, they do find quite a lot of success, especially in Canada um, and in the Carolinas uh, in recruiting these men back to the colors. So while they're, they're not exactly well-trained or well-uniformed yet, by the time the American forces arrive um, opposite um, Montreal and Fort Johnston, uh, they are they have far more experience than most uh, of the troops on either side have in combat. Um, their officers, again, are typically guys that have rallied back to the colors with some prior experience. Um, eventually, they, they'll be outfitted um, in the uniforms similar to the, the Black Watch, um, the government tartan, and things like that. But yeah, at least in the initial stages of the campaign we're talking about today up through Quebec, um, they're primarily still in civilian clothes or old or surplus uniform coats and the like. And the other resource, of course, that the British can draw upon are the Native Americans living in Canada as well. You know, for, for generations, they had been pretty strong allies to the French, um, you know, kind of in the, the French satellite uh, or orbiting the, the French. Uh, but after the fall of Quebec, you know, of course, England takes over that role that the French had played. So a lot of the Native Americans um, that are living in and around the St. Lawrence Valley are also going to rally to the British as well um, and play play a pretty significant role in the campaign, particularly in the the uh, assaults on Montreal and, and that part of the campaign. So. And Carlton's also going to be able to wrangle in um, some of the Iroquois from upstate New York as well. Uh, some of them, again, traditional British allies, not always the, um, uh, again, putting it politely, are not always on great terms with their uh, settler neighbors, um, have also traveled north to offer their services to Carlton and, uh, and the British forces in Canada. And I think uh, it's uh, Guy Johnson, who's in charge of Indian relations for the British Army in the north there. Um, and I think at one point he actually like pitches a plan to go out with like several hundred warriors and lay waste to, uh, to New England, essentially. And it's obviously Carlton rejects that. And then he ends up going overseas to uh, kind of lobby for this to uh, for this plan to be approved. So even uh, early on in the war. You know, men like Guy Johnson were looking for a total war to uh, subdue the rebellion. So in some time, and I think it's August or September, early September, the plan to invade Canada is actually approved and it's formulated. And it's going to be um, it's going to be a invasion of two wings, two armies that will eventually they're supposed to rendezvous um, at Quebec. Now, who was tasked with leading uh, these wings of the American army? Well, at least initially, the, the primary authorization, primary attack, uh, sort of falls on the, to the shoulders of a man named Philip Schuyler. Um, he's a New Yorker. He's a, a descendant of the, the Dutch settlers of New York, uh, a leading citizen of Albany. And uh, by that point, um, one of the, the few major generals, I believe, I think he's already a major general in the army commanding the Northern Department. Um, he's an interesting guy. He is, uh, he's a businessman, he's a large landholder, and he kind of goes about this uh, the best way he, he knows how, kind of gathering troops together, uh, but he's, he's older, his health is not that great, um, and he doesn't really have any significant military experience himself. So ultimately, um, Congress ends up sending him a, uh, a deputy. Um, shall we say, <laughs> um, Richard Montgomery. Um, 
Montgomery's a, a former British officer. He, he'd settled in the colonies as well after the, uh, the previous war. Um, and it's, it's pretty much going to be on Montgomery that uh, Schuyler ends up delegating a lot of the authority to actually prepare and lead this expedition north into Canada, uh, gather the men together. Uh, but it is, you know, his, his, he, as a department commander, he pretty much has the entire northern frontier to worry about. So while you know the major interests are, are Quebec, Montreal, uh, Boston, and the coast, um, he also has to worry about, as, as Billy mentioned, um, the Native American threat, uh, real or perceived. Um, uh, the, the settlers in upstate New York are, are always um, concerned and, and to fe- open fear of the their former neighbors and uh, and native people descending on them, uh, so he has to manage that. And part of that, in addition to trying to allay those fears, but also to get uh, native allies for the expedition headed north, um, he'll be meeting with uh, various tribal leaders throughout the uh, the run up to the campaign actually embarking. Yeah, and so the the other wing, you know the the wing led by Richard Montgomery is really kind of the main thrust, um, but this kind of secondary attempt, it comes about um, due to a kind of, as Nate said, real or perceived slight against Benedict Arnold. Um, you know, Arnold had been the man who, who had helped to take Fort Ticonderoga. Um, he expects a command uh, in the Northern department for this. And he is going to go and lobby Washington for some sort of role in this attack and what he will end up with is a column drawn from the troops besieging Boston um, you know three battalions of troops about 1100 men or so who are going to take a very roundabout way to Quebec rather than the traditional invasion path up Lake Champlain up the Richelieu River up the St. Lawrence he is going to go um, by sea to the, the Kennebec River in Maine, what is, was then part of Massachusetts, and ascend the Kennebec and cross the Maine wilderness to Quebec. Um, now, there's a lot of assumptions going on with this plan. Um, it was based largely on a um, somewhat erroneous map. Um, Arnold was under the impression that you know, it would be about 180 miles. They could cross it in 20 days or so. And what they find is that the distance is almost double that um, between kind of the the northernmost settlements along the Kennebec River, um, right about where Augusta, Maine is today, Old Fort Western, um, Norwich Walk, that area. It's going to be a much, much, much further distance than they had assumed. And Again, this is an area where there is absolutely no European settlement. Um, this is trackless forest, essentially. Um, so it's going to, and I know we're going to get into this in much more detail later on, but it's it's going to be a, a difficult experience for everyone involved. And also, um, just to, to kind of tack on to what Travis was saying about some of the uh, errors in, um, in planning for this expedition, Part of that is because the the map they're largely relying on was prepared in um, 17 early 1760s by a British military engineer named John Montresor. Now the copy that Arnold and and most and Washington uh, George Washington had access to um, had deliberately had information removed from it. There there were features that were changed or omitted, uh, directions that were left off. Um, and, and nobody seems to have quite realized that as they were planning for this expedition. And uh, when they did consult some locals, um, if what they had to say disagreed with the map, uh, a lot of times it kind of fell by the wayside, so. But uh, errors in the map aside, the idea is, you know, kind of this one-two punch. Um, Montgomery is gonna lead troops up, take Montreal, sweep up the, or I guess down the St. Lawrence Valley, and meanwhile, Arnold's going to come around with the right hook and take Quebec by surprise kind of from behind because, you know, who in their right mind would try to cross hundreds of miles of Maine wilderness to attack Quebec? You know, it was not necessarily something that the, the British thought could happen. Um, that being said, it's not long after this plan comes into being that the British are made aware of it. Um, you know, the, <laughs> nothing stayed secret in the camp outside of Boston. And, you know, the British certainly, at least 
by, you know, a few weeks after the expedition had departed, knew that the Americans were coming and were, were trying to prepare. Right, so Schuyler and Montgomery's force are going to be using the uh, traditional Lake Champlain, Richelieu River, uh, St. Lawrence River invasion highway uh, into Canada. But they're going to have to take out a few outposts before they get there. And the first one that they're going to run into is uh, kind of at the head of where Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River meet, and that is Fort St. John. Uh, it was crucial to the safety of Montreal, which is off to the west. Uh, so briefly, can talk a little bit about uh, that siege and it, its multiple attempts uh, over two months. Uh, Schuyler and Montgomery are going to try to take it, and eventually uh, they will. So talk a little bit about that and uh, what the outcome was. I'm going to defer to Nate on that one because I am not as well versed in this part of the invasion. Yeah, you know, I know the general flow of the battle, but uh... yeah, I think um, okay. Oh, what what I know about it is um, Skyler initially does, even though he's sick, he attempts to lead um, the attack on it, and they get there outside the walls, and they they learn that a uh, whole bunch of um, British reinforcements are on the way, as well as some uh, ships coming down the river. Uh, to bombard them so they actually retire uh, and then will return later on and that's when they finally lay siege to um, St. John and its commander uh, Charles Preston uh, is eventually I think it's Preston he uh, he does eventually capitulate and uh, Montgomery in the surrender terms kind of really uh, slights him by saying that you know the bravery of uh, of these defenders could have been used in a better cause than this and um, they're able to march out with honors. And one of those prisoners uh, that is captured and sent to Pennsylvania is a lieutenant in the 7th Regiment, and that's John Andre. And he's taken to Carlisle, where he'll be held in captivity there before being released. And uh, that's one thing I always found interesting, too, is, you know, here, once again, Andre and, and Arnold are both involved in this, uh, this same campaign. Um, just like I think in, when Andre first arrived in Philadelphia in 1774, it's the same time that the first Continental Congress is going on. And Arnold is there um, serving as kind of like a, uh, a second to um, one of, uh, shoot, I can't remember his name now, but uh, Connecticut's, uh, Silas Dean, Connecticut's representative. So Andre, Peggy Shippen, and Benedict Arnold are all right there in Philadelphia in 1774, uh, not even, you know, realizing that uh, these strangers would have such a, a huge impact uh, on their lives. But uh, moving on from St. John, that is the first target that needs to be captured and from there um montreal will then uh surrender basically without a fight because there's just no way that carlton can uh can defend it so if you want to talk a little bit about that because then carlton's going to make a getaway here yeah I so i mean one thing i will say about saint john like you said there's kind of a lot of like back and forth um it's going to take them um I, you know i think that the siege starts like september 17th and it goes on for you know like a month um it's kind of a harbinger of things to come in this campaign like you can kind of get the sense that a lot of the people involved aren't you know, these are not professional soldiers and officers, you know, the, um, you know, they're trying to dig siege works to besiege this fort in like the swampy ground around it. Um, there's a lot of logistical problems with just getting men and artillery to Canada. Um, and it's going to hold things up. And, you know, along with the delays that Arnold will face in Maine, you know, this is going to slow both advances to a crawl at a time of year that you absolutely do not want this to happen. I mean, we're already getting into October, into November. Um, pretty soon, the conditions in Canada are going to be um, just impossible to wage a military campaign and are nearly impossible to. Um, so, you know, I think that's the, the, you know, the biggest thing that comes out of the siege is just the delays that it causes, um, the problems that it causes. You know, Montreal doesn't fall until November 13th. Um, that's very late in the season to be campaigning in Canada. And I'd, I'd like to kind of tack on to what um, Travis said again and, and mention, well, <laughs> one's basically a side note. Um, we've been talking about a lot about the personalities uh, familiar up here. And of course, as the campaign's kind of retreading the, the Fort Ticonderoga route as well, um, some folks out there might be wondering, well, where's Ethan Allen? 
Well, the the answer is uh, Ethan Allen makes a a, a very big mistake. Um, again, assuming that the the Canadian populace will rally to the banner if if the Americans just kind of show up and and call for them, um, they don't. He ends up being grabbed while uh, trying to uh, fight the uh, the British at a battle called uh, Long Point. Um, it basically turns into a skirmish between his his militia troops and British uh, Canadian militia troops. Uh, he's defeated, captured, and carried off to Montreal. Uh, that's kind of the the end of his major participation uh, in this this campaign, at least. And point two, I'd like to make talk about the weather uh, and sort of the approaching winter season. Uh, another thing that's that's creeping up on both Arnold and Montgomery is most of their um, what would well, I think by that time are, are called continental troops. Um, their year-long enlistments are in a lot of cases up um, at the end of 1775. So January 1st, 1776 leaves them potentially without an army to fight this campaign with. Um, and this being, of course, the first year of the war, nobody's entirely sure how that's going to go. So that is also something that's ticking in the back of, of Montgomery and Schuyler and Arnold, everybody's minds as, as sort of the, the fighting just slogs down to nothing. Yeah, so now we'll uh, head east and uh, join Arnold's column as it's heading north. Uh, kind of describe the makeup of Arnold's column. Where did these troops come from? And also there's quite a bit of notable men who are serving in the ranks under him. So uh, touch yeah. upon some of those if you can. Um, sure. So um, Arnold is going to be given command of three battalions. Um, two battalions are going to be made up of New Englanders. You've got a battalion under Roger Enos and one under Christopher Green. These are mostly like guys from Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, and then a third battalion under the command of Daniel Morgan. Um, now you mentioned the, the riflemen coming up from Virginia and Maryland to join the siege of Boston. Um, you know, of course, Arnold, or excuse me, of course, Morgan is a huge part of that. He's going to lead his Virginians up to Boston. Um, while they're in Boston, like you said, they're not really useful in a siege, um, you know, other than taking the occasional pot shot at British troops in the, the works. Um, they're getting into a lot of fights with the Northerners. They're kind of shirking their duty. Um, discipline is kind of going to hell. So they are going to choose um, some of Morgan's Virginians as well as some Pennsylvania riflemen to kind of go along with this expedition, figuring that, you know, these are frontiersmen. This is the kind of campaigning that they should be good at, you know, hacking their way through the wilderness. Um, so those three battalions are going to assemble uh, in, in the Continental Camp in Cambridge. They're going to go by boat um, to the mouth of the Kennebec River. They're going to um, stop just down the river from kind of modern day Gardner, Maine, um, at the home of a man named Reuben Coburn, who has been tasked with assembling all of the boats that these men will need for their expedition up the Kennebec. Um, he's gonna build something like 200 bateaux, these kind of shallow draft, small vessels that are gonna be used to carry the men, their ammunition, their food, their supplies up the river. Um, now, unfortunately, it turns out these most of these boats are pretty poorly constructed. There's a lot of like green wood used. They're they're going to leak. They're going to fall apart. Um, it's going to there aren't enough of them when when Arnold's troops arrive. They're going to spend a few days building more boats. Um, so it's not until September 23rd that they even reach Old Fort Western, um, kind of the modern day Augusta, Maine, and that is really the jumping off point for this expedition. Um, it's the last kind of stop on the way, you know, there's nothing else really between that and Quebec at this time. Uh, so they are going to leave from there. And from there, as I said before, it's going to be a slog because, you know, it's Fort Western stands at the um, uppermost navigable part of the river. Um, you can get boats up, but you've got to haul them around rapids and things like that. Um, there's going to be a lot of portages involved in this. And again, just like Fort St. John, that is going to slow this expedition to a crawl. Um, you know, they, they're, um, gosh, it takes them like a week to get around the falls at Norwich Walk. Um, then they're going to make their way to a place called the Great Carrying Place. Um, they reach that October 11th. Now, keep in mind, they thought it was going to take them 20 days to cross all of this. We're already getting close to that at this point. Um, 
they they reach the great carrying place that's a 12 mile portage across several different lakes just to get from the kennebec to the dead river um these boats have to be hauled out of the water put on men's shoulders carried then all the they have to go back grab the supplies carry them up it's going to be just back and forth and back and forth each one of these portages is going to create incredible delays for the men um, you know, they reach the Dead River. They think it's going to be smooth sailing from there. The Dead River is called that because it's a pretty slow flowing river, uh, except a hurricane hits while they are ascending or I guess descending the Dead River. Um, the river rises, it swamps their camp, they lose boats, food is um, spoiled by the water, they're losing weapons, powder is getting wet, um, men are getting sick and dying. Um, it's really, I think, you know, this is really the low point of the expedition. We're talking like late October, October 21st, 22nd. Um, you know, it's a, Arnold ends up calling a council of war. Um, the men agree to, to keep going, but then Enos's officers have their own council and say, no, we're, we're heading back. Um, so at that point, about 450 men, you know, almost half of this expedition turns around and heads back. Uh, taking a lot of the supplies with them. So it's really a, a, a frightening position to be in. You know, you have to keep pressing on because you can't go back, really. Um, men are eating like tallow candles. They're eating the leather on their shoes and belts. Um, one of the guys who will become famous after this expedition, Henry Dearborn, um, young officer, brings his dog with him. That dog gets eaten. Um, so it's very, very desperate um, throughout October into early November, and it's not until about uh, Halloween, kind of early November, that they are able to cross the height of land, get into the, the Chabert River Valley, where there are French Canadian settlements, and actually get food and some bit of shelter before they continue on to Quebec. Which is, is honestly pretty terrifying for the folks living on the Chaudière River as these horrifying figures kind of stumble out of the woods and, and just ragged remains. I mean, that's another important thing to think of is uh, they're eating the, you know, shoe leather, but they're also eating the, the thongs, the ties that they use to bind a lot of stuff together and just dragging through basically trackless wilderness. Their clothes are just getting ripped to shreds. Um, hunting yeah, they're frocks. They're emaciated. Are, they're sick. They're, it's... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're they're carrying and dragging a lot of of the wounded and sick men, the ones who are who don't just get left behind or are unable to continue themselves. Uh, so it is um, they it can't enough can't be said for the folks along the Shadia River who welcome them into their homes, regardless in a lot of cases of their their personal sentiments towards the war, but just on a humanitarian scale to basically welcome these disaster survivors <laughs> right. uh, into their home. Uh, yeah. It is also, um, I don't want to dogpile on, on Roger Enos, um, but uh, at, at the Go time, <laughs> so I guess the, the coda to that is technically he's absolved by that. There is a, he is court-martialed and the court-martial does officially absolve him of blame. Now, I mean... I go back and forth. In, in, in one sense, he's right. Yeah, it, the expedition has been terribly mismanaged. It's going horribly. But uh, his claim that his men are running low on supplies doesn't really bear a whole lot of weight. You know, the, the entire expedition is running out of supplies. His men are far better supplied than, say, Morgan's advance party or, or Christopher Green's battalion. Um, it's kind of at that late October meeting point, Arnold's gone ahead to do a little more scouting. And, uh, and Green meets Enos and is like, okay, great, you guys are here with the food. And Enos's men kind of look around and go, Council of War, let's go home. Uh, <laughs> to, to be fair, Enos voted against that and then immediately bowed to pressure. Um, it, it's very emblematic of those early war years when pretty much uh, everything's being tried, everybody's trying to run the whole army as a captain or a lieutenant, calling the, the councils of war for every major tactical decision. So, you know, it is, I, I think it's definitely, it was a difficult choice to make, but I, I don't think turning back with that large a portion of the army and that many supplies uh, definitely made things worse for the remainder of the men. Absolutely. Um, I mean, all that being said, though, just remarkable 
fortitude displayed by the officers and the men who continued on. And you know, as as Billy kind of mentioned earlier, there are some Revolutionary War legends who come out of this. I mean, obviously we got Benedict Arnold, but we also have Daniel Morgan, Henry Dearborn, Aaron Burr. Um, these guys all really first make a name for themselves in this this crossing of the Maine wilderness. And, uh, you know, although it tactically is, is really a disaster, um, in hindsight, it kind of gets held up as this amazing feat of, you know, just perseverance and doggedness that these guys didn't do what Enos did and turn around, that they continued on despite everything that they faced. Um, and I guess, you know, we'll talk about the legacy of this campaign later on, but I think that's um, one of the strongest legacies that comes out of this campaign. Yeah, it's just, and it, it is also worth pointing out too, that while Montgomery's column is mostly um, New Yorkers, New Englanders, that Arnold's is, has more of a, a joint uh, cross-colonial nature, that there are Virginians and Marylanders and Pennsylvanians, Massachusetts, uh, some Rhode Islanders, I think, Connecticut troops. And it, it does definitely, I, I think, kind of help uh, bridge, at least for these men, and when they return to the army, they kind of spread that with them. Uh, a little bit of the intercolony rivalry dies away as guys see, oh, you know, that our, our, our colony doesn't have the, the, more, the, you know, sort of sole control over being able to survive this and kind of brings them closer together in the end. Yeah. And I think, uh, I don't think it's been mentioned yet, but one thing of importance to when it, in regards to these men is they were all volunteers too. You know, yeah. they all stepped forward and actually volunteered for this expedition. And mostly if they are looking to kind of, you know, see the elephant uh, before the war is over, if they're, you know, just trying to get out of the idleness of being in that siege around Boston, uh, they do step forward and a lot of them have to be turned away. There's so many. In fact, uh, Arnold can't take them all with them. But uh, of the original 1,000 plus men who do depart uh, from the Boston area and head north, uh, only 675 or so are going to arrive outside the walls of Quebec uh, on November 15th after finally crossing the St. Lawrence River. Uh, Benedict Arnold then is going to parade them out in the Plains of Abraham, uh, the site of the old uh, 1759 French and Indian War Battle of Quebec. Uh, he's hoping to intimidate the British inside. It does not work. After that, he falls back west some 20 miles or so to await Montgomery's army to finally arrive and link up. And on uh, December 2nd, Montgomery is going to arrive with the artillery as well as much needed supplies that were captured from Montreal. And then on December 5th now, finally, the combined American force is going to turn east and head uh, I guess down the river towards uh, Quebec to prepare for uh, siege operations and an assault. So uh, now with Montgomery's wing, linked up with Arnold, how large is this American army and what does Montgomery plan to do with it? Well, I mean, the, the two columns combined and Nate, you might wanna correct me if I'm wrong about this. I, I think it's only about like 1500-ish, maybe 2000 men. It's, it's not a huge column. Um, certainly not when you're faced with the prospect of attacking Quebec. You know, anyone who's ever been to Quebec City, it is, a fortress you know it sits on top of these these incredibly steep bluffs overlooking the st lawrence it's got massive walls um well fortified gates there's blockhouses and outposts all around it you know it is it is a gibraltar and even with the best supplied army and you know all the modern siege artillery you can imagine it's a tough city to take um let alone you know a of like 2,000 half-starved guys with, with a handful of field pieces. Um, it's, it's an incredibly daunting task uh, facing Montgomery. And uh, yeah, Montgomery is going to try and pull what Arnold does and like intimidate them into surrender. I believe one of, one of the, um, oh, what do you call it? One of the, the messengers who goes out to demand the surrender gets like decapitated by a cannonball that the British fire and the British basically like don't don't even countenance this because Carlton is sitting inside he's his garrison is smaller than Montgomery's force but he's got the walls they've got enough food and enough firewood that they can just sit tight in the walls mm. until spring and again you know we talked about the clock ticking we talked about the winter we talked about the soldiers enlistments coming up as soon as spring hits and the St. Lawrence thaws 
the British Navy is going to be bringing reinforcements to Quebec and the siege is over. So again, I think that plays into Montgomery's um, sense of urgency here. Yeah, um, I, I would kind of say, Travis, it's definitely, it's closer to the lower end of that estimate. I know Arnold arrives at about 600. Um, Montgomery, by the time he actually gets to point out Trimble and meets up with Arnold, I think is only down to about 500, 600 guys oh. himself. Uh, I think he ends up, he leaves Wooster in Montreal with quite a few yeah. guys. He leaves quite a few men in uh, at St. John and Ticonderoga. Because uh, if you can say one thing for Arnold, he doesn't have to whole, really worry about a logistics trail because uh, he's, what got there is, is none. <laughs> no, what, what they've got yeah. is what they've got and, and what the, the local French citizen, French Canadians have given them or they've been able to, to purchase. Um, Montgomery definitely has uh, a better logistics trail, and, but that, that does mean he has to detail men to, to, you know, to paddle the canoes, sail ships, guard supplies, uh, to ferry them all the way up, at least to Montreal. Uh, one of the big things he does bring with him is uniforms, um, because so many of, of Arnold's men are, uh, if not totally naked, very close to being practically naked. Uh, so a lot of them are going to end up in, going into this campaign wearing scarlet British captured uniforms uh, with with blankets made into coats over top to try and uh, actually point at the picture behind me. <laughs> there's I, I just noticed there is you can actually see a guy wearing. Uh, two guys wearing some of the scarlet coats behind them. Um, so yeah, the American forces do technically outnumber, I believe, Carleton's men. But yeah, some of them are the, the Royal Highland immigrants. There's at least a couple companies of them. There's the Quebec uh, city militia. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the American militia. <laughs> the um, the motivation, the, the training um, definitely varies wildly how much they want to be there uh, and actually get shot for their city. Um, not Not really a whole lot of urge there but he, he has also i think also pulled a couple hundred marines off of the, yeah, uh, the available like world Navy or vessels. so marines and sailors off of some navy vessels in the river and there is i believe there's also a royal artillery garrison artillery company but yeah like you mentioned uh it definitely doesn't help american morale i forget which courier it is just gets decapitated in front of them on the plane so there's there's definitely a lot of guys are going oh boy uh <laughs> This is, yeah, this is mean, not what we signed up for. That, I think that absolutely speaks to Carlton's confidence in this situation. Like, like I said, he just has to run out the clock on this. He mm -hmm. doesn't really have to. He's not going to. You know, he was there in 1759. He knows what happened when Montcalm marched his army out and fought on the plains of Abraham. He's not going to make that mistake. Yeah, Carlton. Carlton's a smart guy. You know, he's he's been in Canada a long time. He knows the people and and the terrain and the situation, the weather a lot better than really any of the Americans do. So yeah, and he also, of course, I, I don't think the Americans knew quite yet. They may have suspected it, but I don't think the they'd received any intelligence that yeah, there is there's going to be a new army under under Burgoyne arriving in the spring. Uh, so they they definitely will be facing if they can't. Uh, overcome Quebec now, a much tougher nut to crack, uh, if they can do it at all in a few weeks. Right. So now we've described um, kind of the, the idea of how this, if there's going to be a battle of Quebec, it has to happen as soon as possible because enlistments are going to be running out after December 31st. Uh, and not to mention this army, there's no way that they'd be able to sustain a siege throughout the entire winter. Um, so, but in order to get into Quebec itself, uh, you can't really scale the walls of it, okay, much too large. You can only go through the main gates, which means that it was divided into two parts, the upper town, which is within the walls, and then the lower town, kind of going along the river. So the only way you could get into the upper town through the main gate was to go through the lower town. And Carlton obviously realizes this, so he prepares defenses, uh, putting up uh, palisades as well as gun platforms to have this part of the town defended should the Americans try to approach um, and eventually that is going to be the way that they have to go. But uh, Montgomery at first, on December 27th, announced his real first attempt that he wants to try to take the city. He was waiting for a big snowstorm at night, right? To advance under the cover of darkness, under the cover of a snowstorm to get as close as possible to the enemy without them realizing it. Uh, now, the snowstorm that begins on the 27th, that dissipates essentially by late night. So the attack is called off, and lucky for them, because a deserter had actually gone into the walls of Quebec and warned Carleton that an attack was coming. Uh, so for the next several days, the British are going to be in uniform, basically sleeping on their arms, waiting for this attack to come. Finally, that snowstorm Montgomery's been waiting for approaches, 
It is now around 4 a.m., December 31st, 1775. Uh, Arnold in Montgomery are formed up in two separate wings to assault the lower town, Arnold from the north and um, Montgomery from the south. Bring on the battle for us. All right. Yeah, so um, as you said, two wings. Um, we'll, we'll start with Montgomery because that's kind of the easiest one to describe. Um, the attack's actually going to begin with a feint against the walls and some of the gates. Um, uh, and Montgomery has picked up some Canadian volunteers, um, some other local troops. They're going to make a feint towards the walls. And then Montgomery is going to kind of swing along the river on the south side um, by Cape Diamond. And they are going to hit one of those those barricades and blockhouses that you'd mentioned that Carlton has thrown up, um, you know, it's being manned by some local militia. And in a burst of grape shot from one of the guns, um, Montgomery is killed instantly. Um, almost as soon as the attack begins, the commanding officer of the army falls dead, um, as well as a lot of his staff and other officers with him. One of the few men to escape that is actually Aaron Burr. Um, he's, he's there when Montgomery falls and really from that point on that wing of the attack just falls apart. Um, you know, the, the officers who survived this initial contact are going to pull back. They're going to leave Montgomery's body there. Um, they are going to pull back to the Plains of Abraham and call off their, their wing of the attack. Um, further North. We also have an officer getting wounded very early on. You know, uh, Arnold is coming around. His objective is the palace gate. Um, that's going to get him into the lower city, as you said, this, this commercial area along the waterfront of the city. Um, he is going to be uh, hit in the leg very early on in the action. Um, so command is going to devolve to Daniel Morgan. And Morgan unlike the officers of the Southern attack, he's going to keep pushing ahead um, personally out in front of the troops, leading them through this kind of warren of narrow alleyways and streets into the lower city. Um, he's going to personally scale one of the barricades and come across it. He actually falls on their side and has to take cover under cannons to avoid getting uh, stabbed, bayoneted. Uh, but he is going to kind of lead by example, lead his troops into the lower city, um, crossing this first line of barricades. Unfortunately for him, though, uh, the British are going to sally out about 500 troops that are going to come up behind him and basically trap his column between two fires. Um, his men are going to disperse into the houses. It's brutal hand to hand, house to house combat in the lower town uh, all the way up until about 10 a.m. when. Morgan is finally going to surrender. He hands his sword over to a Catholic priest and his men lay down their arms. So um, I'm sure Nate can add, add some more color to this. It's a fascinating <laughs> battle. It happens very quickly, mm -hmm. um, but there's certainly, it's, it's a very vicious fight, I'd say. Yeah, it is kind of fascinating. You know, the, the climax to this whole campaign, you know, more than a, a year almost at this point of discussion, at least, if not practical planning. And yeah, and it, it's all over in, I think, less than an hour, uh, maybe two hours. The the real hope is gone. Because um, like Travis said, uh, Morgan's men, Morgan's uh, side of the attack will keep fighting on into the early hours of the morning. Uh, but yeah, you know, it is like he, Travis mentioned, uh, Montgomery's killed instantly. Arnold is uh, is hit in the the leg and has to be carried off um, very early in the attack on the barricade. Uh, Montgomery's men are actually are cutting through the barricade rather than trying to scale it as Arnold's men do. And they actually do get through uh, the first line of palisade fencing, uh, but then they, they run right into a cannon that kills most of their officers and a good chunk of the men. Um, yeah, I mean, I like, I like to really add the the Virginian uh, Virginians and, and and Pennsylvania and Maryland riflemen that are there with uh, with Morgan. They do also have a, a small detachment of artillerymen with a, a six pounder gun that they've put on a sled. Sled. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a good idea, but it, it doesn't ultimately end up helping them that much because uh, if they they end up firing, they're going to be firing right to their own men in this these very confined alleyways. And of course, most of the lower town buildings, I believe, um, were stone, so that's that's going to cause a lot more flying debris as well. And a six 
pounder is is too light to really practically batter down a barricade as well. Um, so they they do kind of get funneled into the this lower town warren, and basically uh, anyone that that doesn't surrender or escape uh, will be killed in the fighting. So it is it's a very brief, very bloody, uh, very um, quick action uh, before the survivors end up filtering back out onto the plains of Abraham. Yeah, somewhere between like thirty and sixty Americans are killed. Um, over 400 are captured so you know that's that's almost half your effective force Mm -hmm. gone right there Um, so when when Arnold kind of literally and figuratively limps back out of the city um, out beyond the the walls of the town um, the army is shattered yeah, and despite it being shattered, though, Arnold isn't going to quit the siege. No, I was going to say, it, it's, <laughs> it is, it's worth mentioning. Arnold, um, say what you will about his later career, uh, again, being polite. Um, yeah, the man will not give up. You know, he, he's got a couple cannons. He's got some shot and powder. So he, he shells the city. Um, I can't remember. I think at least once more, he, he demands that Carlton surrender. And Carlton basically just laughs, laughs his demands back out of the building. He basically tells him, like, I could sit here till spring. I, I'm doing fine. How about and, you and, guys? And I, I think they're, they're building like siege works out of ice and snow, essentially. Yeah, they're, to the they're piling up snow the pretty much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's I, again Arnold. Arnold does dispatch. I think it's Moses Hazen to speak to Congress and bring them word of of the defeat. And Congress does react um, quickly. I guess <laughs> you could say comparatively, uh, they do call for more men to be recruited and sent, especially to Canada. But the, you know, the the clock is basically out. You know, the mm-hmm. the timer is rung. Uh, Quebec did not fall, and the American reinforcements are not going to arrive. Um, until spring essentially mm-hmm. yeah and by then uh they're they're entirely driven out of canada because carlton does eventually come out of the walls and he pushes yeah. the americans all the way back down to fort ticonderoga and and arnold's gonna fight a pretty good fighting retreat mm-hmm. um as much as yeah, he's really that's... capable of um you know all the way back to montreal and back down to lake champlain of course culminating in the battle of valcour island there yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the American force doesn't go easily, uh, even once they are defeated. Because, uh, again, not only does he have his men from the original uh, original fighting in Montgomery's men, uh, by that by the time they, they're pulling back to Montreal and back towards Ticonderoga, they've, they have received some reinforcements. Um, I mm-hmm. believe they've received a, a brigade of New Jerseyans, uh, some New Yorkers, a Connecticut regiment or two, uh, a regiment of New Hampshireans under um, Thomas Theodore Bettle. Um, so they, they have, he has received reinforcements, but the big problem is the same problem that he and Montgomery had before they embarked their campaign the previous year with camp disease, um, smallpox, uh, especially, yeah. uh, these guys, all these new soldiers have to go through the same thing. They all have to, if they've not had, um, caught illnesses before they're going to catch them when they're crammed all together in the camps with poor sanitation. Um, they've got to get broken into actually traveling living in tents or in in more primitive conditions uh it's the same thing you see in the civil war you know a lot of these guys are throwing away new issued equipment haversacks uh things they don't think they're going to need (laughs) that uh yeah they're going to end up needing overcoats and things like that once they get to canada and yeah it's it's it seems like every step that um that arnold and and the americans managed to write something kind of undercuts them you know they're they're they may be able to hold on in the the upper canada the well, lower Canada, upper uh, New York area, but then um, Bettle loses his entire regiment at a place called the Cedars. Um, basically, he's he's scared out of uh, fighting the British because they they he's afraid of how many uh, Native people they've brought to the fight. He thinks they're going to be massacred. They the British pretty adequately play on the the colonists' fears of that and pretty much talks their whole regiment into surrendering arnold's furious he tries to fight but it's pretty much too late he gets the prisoners back but not their arms or anything else yeah and i think it is noteworthy to say that uh when the american army finally does uh debark from saint john to head to fort ticonderoga the last man to step foot off of canadian soil is benedict arnold shoots his horse as the british are approaching and then loads up in a boat and heads south to fort ticonderoga I think um, probably one of the more 
important things, at least when it comes to the memory of the Battle of Quebec that comes out of this, is the death of Richard Montgomery. He really does become, besides Joseph Warren, um, the first real American martyr uh, in this cause. And he is the highest ranking American officer to be actually killed in battle because he was promoted to major general prior to the assault. He didn't know it yet. Word did not reach him. So he was a major general. Joseph Warren, uh, though he was uh, commissioned as a um, a major general, it wasn't actually approved. And at Bunker Hill, he was only serving as like a volunteer. So it doesn't really count. So Montgomery is the highest ranking officer to fall for the American cause. Uh, but in what ways does the memorialization of Montgomery really transpire? And even today, how do we remember him? Uh, especially in the decades following the revolution, it was huge. So, so go ahead. Uh, to, to draw a Civil War parallel, I always like to compare Richard Montgomery to Albert Sidney Johnson. He's this like incredibly experienced, very mm -hmm. promising op officer that like everyone has kind of hung their hopes on that like this is our guy. He's going to you know win this tremendous battle and he gets killed so early in the conflict that it just, you know, it, it opens the door for all of these what ifs, you know, what if mm -hmm. Richard Montgomery had survived? What if he had been in command? You know, um, it's. As you said, he he very much becomes a martyr. Um, you know, it, it helps that there's that famous painting of his yeah. death that we we see kind of whenever we open a book on the Revolutionary mm -hmm. War. Um, you know, kind of like the death of Wolf. It's this very like Christ-like martyr painting, um, and I think that accurately depicts the way that a lot of Americans view him during the war. Um, you know, the the idea of promise cut short. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say definitely it doesn't help that, you know, to the the Americans, he dies in a very similar way to to Wolf. You know, there is a lot of resonance. I mean, not winning the battle, but he is killed at Quebec <laughs> at the walls. So, it, you know, it, it, it does kind of it echoes that nicely to to a lot of folks to kind of build up that image. Um, I would say shouting out as a, uh, a resident of the greater Washington DC area. Uh, one of the most direct impacts it has, if you live in the greater DMV, is Montgomery County, Maryland. Montgomery County. Yeah. Uh, not 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 long after his death, um, it's split off and named after him. And of course, in Rockville, you have Richard Montgomery High School. So you know there are there's going to be a lot of place names that are going to that are going to be named after Richard Montgomery, and it, it's going to definitely have. Um, a long, long lasting impact as, in sort of the, the mythology and martyrology of the revolution as that um, the, the man who sort of cast off the British, British shackles as an officer of the king's army and, and joined the, the cause and, and laid down his life. Yeah, and even uh, the story of his remains is fascinating too uh, and how he's memorialized here uh, with his gravesite. But he's originally buried within the walls of Quebec by the British. When they find his body later that day, uh, they recognize who he is, bring him in and bury him with full military honors. Uh, and two, coming out of this, his memorial that is currently in front of us, St. Paul's Church in New York City today, that's the first memorial that was actually ever um, funded and uh, approved by Congress. The Continental Congress actually approved for that uh, to be erected in his honor, although it would take decades before it finally was um, completed. And then his body, too, in the early 1800s is disinterred and brought to Leyden State. It's by the governor of New York at the time is able to work in conjunction with um, officials in Quebec to have it retrieved and returned to New York. And it's laid actually in state in Albany in the state capitol building. Uh, and then it's taken to New York City and, and buried beneath the, uh, the monument there at St. Paul's Church and had full ceremonies. His wife was there present. Um, thousands of people attended it it truly was like this you know this national figure was being returned home and every decades after the war still everybody recognizes this and turned out anything else uh, you'd like to add before we get into suggested reading and wrap this up uh, i will i will throw a shout out of course to benedict arnold um <laughs> uh yeah i, I We'll add that this is kind of what um, this is sort of the reputation maker for Arnold. Mm -hmm. um, he was always a very, very sort of he always wanted more, um, which his his track record early in the war proves on, you know, pretty much everything he takes on. He does at least decently at um, now 
how much his ego will then inflate those accomplishments with what he thinks he deserves because of them. Uh, different matter entirely. But in Canada, he um, he definitely has to pick up the pieces from someone he, he pretty much um, had had trusted and believed to be the, the mm-hmm. guy in charge with Montgomery. So his, his fighting withdrawal from Canada, the battle at Valcor Island, and sort of along with Schuyler, the desperate sort of defense of the, the Lake Champlain area, uh, basically trying to, to stall for time over the next year um, before, before Burgoyne's men will come down into New York as well as part of Clinton's sort of grand campaign. Um, you know, it is kind of, and for the men under him, it is pretty much a long stretch of about a year, two years where there, there really isn't any break or any relief. So while, you know, in, in retrospect and sort of in the fullness of history, uh, we can kind of see the, the era breaking away for a lot of these guys, they're not going to have a chance to stop and take that in um, and what it means for quite a long time because uh, the war is going to keep bulldozing on for them. Yeah. And just to add to that, you know, it's also, a, if, if it's going to make anyone else's reputation, it's Daniel Morgan's. Um, you know, Daniel Morgan is kind of a, a local figure uh, before this expedition. You know, people certainly from the Valley of Virginia have... The old know, wagoner. The, yeah, the old <laughs> wagoner. Um, but this is going to gain him um, kind of national attention, and particularly among the high command of the Continental Army. Um, you know, he's certainly shown his tenacity, his his pugnaciousness. Like this guy is, if you're in a fight, you want him on your side. He's a tremendous leader of men who will put his self at risk. Uh, and um, so, you know, he's he's going to languish in imprisoned in, in Canada for, for quite some time. But once he is exchanged, um, he is going to see his rise kind of through the Continental Army and you know, be given greater and greater responsibility. And of course, you know, we all know what he did at Saratoga, what he does at Calpens. Um, that legend begins during the march to Quebec. And, and in contrast, I don't I don't think that Colonel Campbell, who who ordered the withdrawal of Montgomery's wing, I don't think we ever hear from him again. So uh, yeah. All right. Well, in the uh, the chat, we got a lot of questions regarding uh, reading material. So uh, you know, give me your few of your favorite uh, uh, books on this subject, whether it's uh, just on the American Revolution in the North or the actual Benedict Arnold's March, the Quebec campaign as a whole. Uh, let's uh, kind of wrap this up with that to, uh, you know, sure. give the people something to read. So I think a, a good overall view of the campaign that kind of delves into the backstory, why they're going to make these expeditions is uh, The Battle for the 14th Colony by Mark mm-hmm. Anderson. Um, very good overview of the entire Canada expedition. Um, now, if you want to get kind of a, more into the nitty gritty, um, one of my favorite books is called Voices from a Wilderness Expedition. Um, it's edited by a guy named Stephen Darley. And what it is, is he took all of the known extant eyewitness accounts of the expedition through Maine, you know, kind of all the journals kept by soldiers and officers during this expedition and published them all in one volume and for you know an actual eyewitness primary account they're fantastic it's really great reading and then last i'm trying not to take up too much time this is another one of my favorite books following their footsteps this was written by a a local historian up in maine who wanted to write a guide to anyone interested in actually following the route that these guys took um, so I, I actually did it backwards. I was coming back from Quebec into Maine, uh, but I found this book to be absolutely indispensable for locating, you know, the campsites, the portage sites, the trails that they took. Um, really, really fun if you're ever way up north. Um, it's great to have a copy of this. Very cool. I would add uh, my first two recommendations are going to be kind of what got me interested in the Canadian campaign uh, campaigns, uh, which would be the the first two books of a trilogy by a man named Kenneth Arnold. Uh, he was a, a native of Maine, a journalist, a writer, um, World War One veteran, served in the uh, Siberian expedition or North Russian expedition of the army. Uh, but he wrote the first two are Arundel and Rabel in Arms, and they kind of they they're the the diptych that sort of takes you from the early days of the revolution through Quebec, and then the Rabel in Arms wraps up. Uh, the end of that book is the end of the Saratoga campaign. Um, they are fiction, they're historical fiction, but Arnold 
um, Arnold laid a lot of the historiographic groundwork for especially the first person accounts. He went rummaging through a lot of local historical societies, things like that, to read these original diaries and letters and uh, pension applications and things. And it, it constructs one of the best views, I think, uh, a fiction view of the, the sort of the life, the attitudes of um, of continental and, and British soldiers and subjects and civilians uh, throughout uh, the that whole campaign area. Uh, Bookwise, I'll also shout out. Um, I have a copy of it here. Uh, it's Hal Shelton's biography of Richard Montgomery. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's another one, <laughs> but uh, it is. It's a it's a good read as well if you want to find more out about the man uh, Montgomery himself. Um, and then, yeah, there, there are also, there's several other regimental books, if you want to get kind of into the more granular, uh, soldier's life, um, sort of things. Um, I, I know there, it's fairly easy to find copies of, I think it's the second New Jersey's orderly book from the, their service, which is post Quebec, but goes through that, that, that campaign of the withdrawal from Canada, uh, to Ticonderoga. Uh, and similarly, there's also, if you want kind of a little bit to the, the side of that, um, there's a fairly recent book about the third New Jersey in upstate New York and then at Ticonderoga following the fall of Quebec that it gives you kind of an idea of, of sort of the mindset of the officers and soldiers that Montgomery and, and Arnold are worried about in, the, in that case of, uh, of potentially ha- not having an army anymore to fight this campaign with. And I think probably the uh, two most well-known books on the Quebec campaign that we haven't uh, mentioned so far are, well, Arthur Lefkowitz's Benedict Arnold's Army, as well as Benedict Arnold and the Company of Heroes. And then um, somebody had mentioned it in the chat, but um, it's uh, through Howl- Howling Wilderness. Yeah, yep, Thomas David and Yeah, that's, yep. that was one of the first books I had read on the campaign. And yep. It's a great narrative. Yeah, it's it's a good readable overview if you yep. want, if you want to find a good starter, basically, to get your, your mm-hmm. groundings and, and where to go. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you. I mean, this has been awesome. A lot of great information and detail here in this discussion. Uh, So thank you again, Nate and Travis, for joining me tonight. And um, for our viewers, you can join us for our next Rebel World Revelry on February 20th at 7 p.m. We'll be sitting down with Tom Hand of Americana Corner to discuss all things George Washington as we celebrate the 290th birthday of this great American. So thank you again for joining us here tonight. And on behalf of Emerging Revolutionary War, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Sunday. Thank you.